Hello! In today's lesson, we will be discussing anxiety, depression, and suicide. As we go through this lesson, please know that if you are ever experiencing feelings of sadness, helplessness, and hopelessness, help is available. So please reach out to a trusted adult, counselor, parent, coach, friend, and let them know what is going on. Experiencing difficult emotions is a pretty normal part of life, especially in the teenage years as you guys face a lot of different changes in your life. They occur for a variety of reasons, including hormonal changes, relationship issues, grief, or stress. A common feeling with these situations is anxiety. And if we put a definition to anxiety, it's the condition of feeling uneasy or worried about what may happen. For example, someone might feel anxious about an, an important class presentation. Having occasional anxiety is a natural response to life e life's events. So those are those brief feelings of worry, insecurity, fear, self-consciousness, or even panic are all common responses to stressful events. Usually though, once the stressful situation is over, so is the anxiety it created. And we can also use stress management techniques to help reduce those feelings of anxiety. However, sometimes anxiety can get out of control and that's what's called an anxiety disorder. So this is a condition in which real or imagined fears are difficult to control. It's one of the most common mental health problems among children and teens and as many as 13% of children between the ages of nine and 17 experience an anxiety disorder each year. People with anxiety disorders try to avoid situations that make them feel anxious or fearful. And there are several different types of anxiety disorders, including phobias, obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD, panic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and generalized anxiety disorder. Now, when you think of depression, what do you think of? Do any of these images come to mind? Sometimes people do think of these images when they think of the word depression. But in reality, depression looks like these people. They look like all of us. Sometimes it's very difficult to see depression or feelings of depression in other people because they look like each and every one of us. Even celebrities uh, go through a lot of these feelings as well. But the truth of the matter is depression affects people of all ages and ethnic backgrounds. According to the National Alliance of Mental Illness, or NAMI, about one in five teens will suffer from depression by the time they reach adulthood. In addition, during adolescence, girls are twice as likely as boys to develop depression. If we put a definition to depression, it is a prolonged feeling of helplessness, hopelessness, and sadness. And feelings of sadness affect everyone, but depression usually lasts longer and may produce symptoms that do not go away over time. Typically, when somebody is feeling those feelings of helplessness, hopelessness, and sadness, it disrupts their daily activities. That's the big, a big indicator. So it may make it hard to get out of bed in the morning, do homework, even socializing with friends or family may become taxing for them. So it's starting to disrupt things that they would normally do. Depression may require medical help. So it's important for someone who is feeling these feelings to get that medical help. There are several characteristics that indicate somebody is dealing with these feelings of depression. They include persistent sadness, a loss of pleasure and interest in activities once enjoyed, fatigue or loss of energy, so they have that lethargic feeling, restlessness and irritability, they may have difficulty sleeping, or they might oversleep, so it's hard for them to get out of bed in the morning, that can go either way, or because they're feeling um, so helpless, hopeless, and sad, they might not be able to fall asleep at night. They may have a feeling of apathy, and apathy is a lack of strong feeling, interest, or concern. So instead of somebody having a really strong opinion about something that people would normally have an opinion on, they just kind of don't care at all. Other characteristics of depression include weight or appetite changes. So again, this one could go both ways. Somebody might lose their appetite and stop eating, so they would lose a dramatic amount of weight. They might also start to eat more as a way of coping with their feelings of sadness, helplessness, and hopelessness. So they might gain a lot of weight. 
They may have a lack of concentration or difficulty making decisions. They may also have feelings of worthlessness, hopelessness, low self-esteem, anger, or guilt, and thoughts or expressions of suicide or death. If somebody is experiencing depression, they may exhibit only one of these characteristics. They may have several of them. It just depends on the person and their experience of depression is also different for each person. When we think about depression as well, there are also three types of depression. There's minor depression, major depression, and dysthymic disorder. So minor depression is a mood disorder accompanied by feelings of hopelessness, sadness, or helplessness, and is diagnosed when two to four symptoms or those characteristics that we just talked about are present and last for at least two weeks. So it's not like um, somebody one day has no interest or maybe no opinion on something. These symptoms or the characteristics have to last for at least two weeks for it to be considered a depressive episode. Minor depression might go away on its own or it might become chronic and last for a very long time. And the experience of depression can change over time as well. So somebody might be able to manage their day-to-day -day activities with minor depression, but they may get little enjoyment out of it. Major depression is a mood disorder accompanied by long lasting feelings of hopelessness, sadness, or helplessness. These are much more intense feelings of sadness, helplessness, or hopelessness than minor depression as well. So this is when somebody would get into a very dark mood. It is a serious medical illness that should be distinguished from normal temporary feelings of sadness after a loss, such as a death of a relative or a friend. With major depression, these symptoms can last for weeks or months and is very noticeable to other people. The last type of depression is dysthymic disorder, and this is a long-lasting form of depression or chronic. It's continuous or persistent. It's diagnosed when two or more of those symptoms are present, and it's not as severe as major depression, so someone would probably not get into those really, really dark moods. Um, but they will have had those characteristics of depression or those symptoms for more than two years. So this is when it lasts for a very long time. There are several different causes of depression. One of them is an inability to cope with a life crisis. For example, a loss of a boyfriend or girlfriend, moving to a new neighborhood, or failing to make an athletic team. They may also have experienced a severe life crisis, such as being the victim of a crime, witnessing a tragic event, or being in a natural disaster like an earthquake, tornado, hurricane, or flood. Depression can also be caused by changes in brain structure. So our brain is still developing through our teenage years. Um, and during our teen years, there is a what's called pruning or clearing of the gray matter in the outer layers of the brain of the um, cerebrum. So you can see that in that picture in the lower right hand corner where that gray matter is versus the white matter. And the gray matter consists of closely packed and interconnected nerve cells. So that pruning process involves clearing out all of those unused brain cell connections and strengthening the ones that are used. So when this happens, I always like to explain that it's like things just kind of click. I remember going through um, this process myself through my teen years and into early adulthood. And there was just like one day, I just felt like I got things. Learning was easier, memory was easier, um, critical thinking skills and problem solving skills were just easier. And that's because of the strengthening of all these connections between our brain cells. So when the process is complete, teens are able to focus more intently and learn more deeply. And scientists have actually learned that there is a significant increase in mental disorders when this clearing out process takes place. They don't really know why or what exactly about this process is causing an increased uh, instance of depression, but they are still researching that to find that out. A person can also have a genetic predisposition for depression. So a person can inherit through the genes that they get from their parents the likelihood of develop, developing depression. And the closer someone is connected to a biological family member that is depressed or has had, had have had a depressive episode, the greater likelihood the teen, teen may also become depressed. For example, a teen whose mother suffers from depression is more at risk than if the teen's aunt suffers from depression. So the closer a person is in relation 
to them, the more likely they will also suffer from a depressive episode. A person can also have low serotonin levels, which is a chemical that is involved in controlling states of consciousness and mood. It's one of those happy chemicals that make us make us feel really good. And our serotonin levels fluctuate normally and are not the same in all people, but some people are at risk for having a lower serotonin level, which puts them at a higher likelihood of also having a depressive episode. So that is another cause of depression. Traumatic family events. Teens who have experienced traumatic family events are at an increased risk for depression as well. So a divorce, a serious illness of a family member, a parent losing a job, a family member going to jail, um, or maybe just a sudden absence of a family member. Those are all traumatic family events that could increase the likelihood of suffering from a uh, depressive episode. Physical illnesses and disorders are another cause of depression. So teens who have had certain physical disorders are or are ill may experience depression. For example, heart disease, having cancer, diabetes, stroke, those all can increase the likelihood of having a depressive episode. And lastly, alcohol or other drug use is another cause of depression. Someone who is dealing with substance abuse typically is also dealing with some sort of mental disorder. Um, so teens who drink alcohol and abuse other drugs have much higher rates of depression than those that don't. And part of that is because their brains aren't fully developed and depressant drugs have an even greater effect on their mood. So teens who suffer from depression and use alcohol and other depressant drugs can become even more depressed. There are several risks that accompany depression as well. School performance is one of those. If somebody is suffering from depression, they may be absent from school more, they might not be motivated to do their homework. They might have difficulty concentrating. That would all affect their grades. So poor grades and school absences are also a warning sign of teen depression. They may also feel socially isolated. Teens who are depressed tend to withdraw or distance themselves from their friends. And they also stop participating in enjoyable activities that they normally like to do. They may develop a drug addiction. Teens who are depressed might depend on alcohol or other drugs to escape from their problems and change their mood. They may also develop other addictions like exercising too much because that is a way they're trying to deal with their feelings of depression. And exercise is a good thing, but too much of it can be a bad thing. Too much of anything can be a bad thing, just in general. Um, they may develop a physical illness. So when depressed, the body's immune system is suppressed and it's not able to fight off pathogens as well. So it actually makes us more susceptible to colds and the flu. We can't fight off all of the germs that we normally would be able to fight off if we were feeling good. They may also develop another mental disorder. Teens who are depressed are at an increased risk for developing bipolar disorder and personality disorders in adulthood. They're also at an increased risk for having major depression in adulthood as well. And lastly, they are at risk for attempting suicide. The good news is we have ways to treat depression. More than 80% of individuals who receive treatment experience significant improvement. However, the unfortunate side of this is fewer than half of people will actually seek help for their depression. Children and adolescents who are depressed often suffer for years before they are actually diagnosed. And we have a couple different means of treatment. There is therapy and medication. The type of therapy that's used to treat depression is cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. It's a type of psychotherapy that involves changing the way a person thinks and modifying their behaviors. Other forms of therapy that are used to treat depression include individual counseling and a combination of therapy and medication. The medications that are used to treat depression is called an antidepressant, and this is a drug that's used to relieve depression. There are a couple different kinds of antidepressants. For example, some regulate serotonin levels to regulate a person's mood, but they usually take several weeks to become effective. And this is a key thing to know because some people have a hard time continuing to take their antidepressants or staying on that regimen because they take it for a week and then they don't feel better. So then they stop taking them. So it really is important if somebody is prescribed an antidepressant for take, to take it for several weeks 
for it to actually become effective and for them to actually start feeling a little better. Antidepressants do require medical supervision because they do have some side effects. For example, some antidepressants can cause an increased risk of suicide in children and teens. So there's that increased risk of suicidal thoughts, which is interesting because they're supposed to be helping those thoughts. So medical supervision is definitely necessary with those. We also have other strategies or healthy lifestyle factors that we can incorporate into our daily lives to help cope with feelings of helplessness, hopelessness, and sadness. Talking with a parent, guardian, mentor, or other trusted adult can help with this, staying connected with our friends, practicing healthful behaviors like eating nutritious meals and getting exercise is a good combatant against depression, using anger management skills or stress management skills to cope with tough situations, avoiding the use of alcohol or other drugs, taking steps to develop resilience or that ability to bounce back when things get tough and seeking treatment if these strategies don't relieve those feelings of helplessness, hopelessness, and sadness. Sometimes depression or feelings of sadness, helplessness, and hopelessness can lead to suicidal thoughts. So if we look at some statistics about suicide, it is the second leading highest cause of death among people ages 15 to 24, and it is actually the leading cause of death in Dakota County. Each year, 15% of all teens in this age group will consider suicide, and more than half of those will actually attempt it. In the US, roughly 5,000 young people ages 15 to 25 commit suicide, and 1 million people die from suicide each year. Lastly, females are more likely to attempt suicide, and males are more likely to actually complete it. If you don't know what suicide is, it is the intentional taking of one's own life. And it's usually a cry for help. So somebody wants other people to notice that they are suffering or, or are in pain. Of those that commit suicide, more than 90% are suffering from depression or another mental disorder or have a history of abusing alcohol or other drugs. There are several warning signs of suicide, including direct statements, such as I wish I were dead, indirect statements, such as I can't take it anymore, writing poems, song lyrics, or diary entries that deal with death, direct or indirect suicide threats, an unusual obsession with death, withdrawal from friends, and dramatic changes in personality, hygiene, or appearance, so someone might stop showering, for example, or caring what they look like, other warning signs include impulsive, irrational, or unusual behavior, a sense of guilt, shame, or rejection, or negative self-evaluation, or self-esteem, or self-identity, deterioration in schoolwork or recreational performance, giving away personal belongings, which is a big one. Someone's giving away an item like a ring or a necklace that they got from their grandma who is no longer with them. That's a big indication. Substance abuse. Complaints about physical symptoms, such as stomach aches, headaches, and fatigue. Persistent boredom and indifference. Violent actions, rebellious behavior, or running away. And intolerance for praise or rewards, so they do not accept compliments. There's no specific risk factor that conclusively predicts whether a person will commit suicide. However, the more risk factors that are present may increase a person's desire to commit suicide. And we can fit these risk factors into different categories. Personality risk factors include impulsive or aggressive tendencies, feelings of hopelessness, low self-esteem, loneliness, despite having a lot of friends, reckless or daring behavior, low stress and frustration tolerance, and poor problem solving or coping skills. Behavioral risk factors include alcohol and drug abuse and addiction, truancy or skipping school, delinquency, aggressive and violent behavior, risky sexual behavior, like having unprotected sex, and withdrawing from normal activities. Historical risk factors for suicide include previous suicide attempts, self-injury without the intent to die, experiencing of abuse, whether physical or psychological, unwillingness to seek treatment or help, and bullying, either when they are the victim or the perpetrator. Environmental risk factors include stressful life events in the family, which may include death, divorce, or financial problems, 
exposure to another person's suicide or to graphic sensationalized accounts of suicide, like the TV show 13 Reasons Why, barriers to accessing mental health or physical health treatment, local occurrence of suicide, especially of someone who, with whom a person has a close relationship, like a family member, friend, or schoolmate, negative social and emotional environment at school, including negative attitudes, beliefs, feelings, and interactions of staff and students, and discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender, race, and ethnicity, or physical characteristics. And as I said before, there's no one particular risk factor that is going to indicate whether a person attempts to commit suicide or not, but rather the more risk factors a person has, the increased likelihood someone would attempt suicide. There is hope and help available. It's really important to take suicidal thoughts and behaviors seriously, whether it's a person's own thoughts and behaviors or those of a loved one. Talking to a trusted adult is a great way to get help. We also have a National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK, which is available 24 hours a day, every single day. All calls are free and confidential. If somebody is not able to call, they can also text the crisis text line to 741741. Here in Dakota County, we have a crisis response unit that provides 24-hour phone and face-to-face -face crisis intervention consultation. The number is there on your screen. And if someone is ever with another person who is suicidal, it's very important that they don't leave them. Drive them to the hospital or call 911. Getting them help is essential at this time. Overall, these are tough topics to talk about and they're even tougher to deal with, but it's really important that anyone who is dealing with feelings of helplessness, hopelessness, or sadness knows that they are not alone and that hope and help is available. Reaching out to any, through any of these avenues to get help is essential.